Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. Tonight we go behind the scenes to the rehearsal studios at the Denver Center Theater Company. It's an exclusive early look at their new production of Ruined. Here's my visit with their guest director, Sarette Scott. Well, I'm awfully delighted to get a chance to meet you, Sarette, that this is your first time directing here at the Denver Center Theater Company. Welcome to Denver. Thank you. I'm loving it so far. Good. Yeah. How long have you been here? Well, a few days, but we just started rehearsal, but I have been here to do the production meeting, so it was great. So we're catching you virtually at the beginning of the process. Absolutely. I'm still getting used to the altitude, but it's working. Well, you'll hear Denver um, people telling you to drink water, all that sort of yes. thing. You're coming to Denver for your first directorial project at the Denver Center Theater Company for a very important uh, voice being brought to Denver for the first time. Very important play. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Ruined. Ruined is a play that's all too topical. It's, mm -hmm. it's still very much a part of the landscape of Africa and frankly, I believe, of other parts of the world. This story, this story is just told in Africa, in the Congo, the Dem uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. It is a story of survival, of compassion, mm. of extraordinary violence, uh, extraordinary ways of getting from one day to the next with just the basics. Uh, it has is so human that it almost doesn't have something that you feel like <clears throat> makes it theatrical. Right. You just enter this world, you enter this story through the people, the characters. And the, the lens by which we see this world, the story, is through a woman's point of view. Yes, Mama Nadi is her name. She has a, mm, what would you call it, sort of a roadside bar. Uh, that a little roadhouse. A little roadhouse, mm -hmm. exactly. And they, they sell liquor and food. And women uh, live there and service the soldiers. That's part of the reason why you've so aptly described it as a much more universal story yeah. than just the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yes. It, the story doesn't try to sugarcoat anything. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is really interesting is when you have a place like the Democratic Republic of Congo where there is absolutely no infrastructure left anymore in several parts of the country. That's I mean, not an understatement. I mean, when you say that about is, this place. It, yeah, yeah. So when you have people who take that and develop something like Mama Nadi did, they also, on the one hand, that's the good news. They have made something that people can, you know, a roadside stand, you can come, you can get a drink, and you can get some food. Um, but it also services other things that, on the face of it, you might feel um, is destructive. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to look at it from the other side. Is there, There's so many sides to these stories, and there's so many of these stories, but... Um, the, the women who are there have in some ways been rescued by Mama Nadi. Mm. They have been used in ways that are, I can barely describe by soldiers and people in certain communities. Sometimes their own families. Their own families. Because in war, it's just what you can do to get to the next day. With such a powerful and such um, a serious piece, mm -hmm. how do we find um, Colorado as the place where this story is being told? How do you find... I, you know, I think that any time you, you have a story that is topical like this, and you can read about it in the newspaper, you can see it on CNN and some of the other um, broadcasts, you, you can sit there and say, oh my goodness, I didn't even know this was happening. It's, and it's troubling. Theater gives access in a way that is so extraordinary, even more than film or TV, because in front of you, this event is taking place in this immediate moment. And you're breathing the same air. The same air. You're having the mm -hmm. same experience at the moment. So 
you can take these kinds of stories and everybody will be in the Congo and dealing with this at that moment. You don't have anything that separates you. And I think that's the great thing about theater. And you're no stranger, not only to the theater, mm -hmm. you've had a storied career as it is already, but you're also very adept at dealing with these very difficult topics. I think part of it for me is that when you are telling a story, the larger story is what you're going to end up with. Mm -hmm. But everyone in it has a story. Everybody on the street, everybody in the world has one. And it's unless I'm able to actually enter your story, your life, that little thing that makes you who you are, when, unless I'm actually able to do that, I'm not going to get the, full, the fullness. Mm. And I think part of what goes on is that uh, the actors and, and some playwrights as well feel that I, I get very much involved into, into things that may be just nuanced, but they make the whole picture. Since this is your first time being with the Denver Center Theater Company, and it's too early for you to sort of sum up that experience, what is your initial take on the Denver Center Theater Company? I haven't actually seen anything that runs quite as smoothly with and as large as it is. It's, it's an extraordinary uh, complex of, mm -hmm. of, of theaters. And I'm just having a great time. I have had no problems with anything. Uh, all I say is, you know, I think I, before I say need so-and-so, three people are saying, okay, what is it you need? Because mm -hmm. we're here to help you out with this. And because of that, it makes, the, it makes not only my experience very pleasant, but it also makes a story that we're having to tell that's a little tough. Mm -hmm. It makes us uh, uh, feel like that there are people who recognize that we can't stay in that world all day. We have to have some way of getting through it and, and going on with a life in Denver and not in the Congo. That's a beautiful tribute to the Denver Center Theater Company that you've just given. And I, I know that you're still really early in the process. I'm, I'm hoping we can come back and, and sort of touch base with you again as you get closer to your opening. Oh, absolutely. I welcome it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we find out about the research that goes into this kind of production with dramaturg Douglas Langworthy. Who thought that just a few days ago when we got to share lunch during the, the New Play Summit mm -hmm. that we'd be here talking about your job here at the Denver Center Theater Company? Well, right after um, the New Play Summit, I went right into rehearsals for Ruined immediately on the next day. Um, so there's no slowing down for me. <laughs> What I want to find out from you first is, mm -hmm. for our viewers who don't know what a literary manager, or more importantly, a dramaturg is, tell us what that means. Okay. What do you do? I like to say I'm like a literary advisor for the theater. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, in terms of new plays, I'm always reading scripts that come in to try to pick out those plays that we might want to feature in the summit or might want to produce on our stages. Mm -hmm. um, in, with regard to new productions, or a production like Ruined, um, as a dramaturg, I'm there to kind of be a resource person and a research guy. So I do all this research into the background of the play, the country that it's set in, um, the military factions that are there that's going on, because it's set right now. There's a lot of stuff I can pull. Um, YouTube videos, uh, um, all sorts of things to help. So you help the actors, you help the yeah. designers. Yeah, mostly I help the actors, but actually I did a whole packet of research before the designers had their first mm -hmm. meeting. So, I, yeah, I helped them too. You were also connected um, to a pre-event that mm -hmm. we got to attend. Tell me about that. Well, um, through one of our uh, employees named Tina Reich, and she's a community sort of outreach person, um, she located this woman named Karen Sugar, who runs the Women Glo Women's Global Empowerment Fund here in Denver. And basically, that, that's a um, not-for-profit that helps women in Uganda who've been through war and are just struggling to get back on their feet by providing them with microloans. And those are loans of about $57 to start a small business through which they can feed their families and get their children back in school. And how does that relate to Ruined? Well, basically, I feel that the theater should not just... Um, be inside of its four walls, but we actually have a connection through the, the literature that we do. We have a connection to our mm -hmm. community and to the world at large. 
And this is a play that deals with large global issues. And um, I think at the end of this play, you come out of it wondering, well, what can I do to help? How can I make a difference? And this is a local woman who's created her own organization that's actually making a difference to just the kind of people that are in this play. Mm. So um, it's a way at to- At a different stage At in... a different stage. It's like um, the war in the Congo is still going on, but in Uganda it ended about uh, 10 years ago. And a lot of these women were in camps for 10 years and are now just getting back to their villages and cities. In the, in the research that you've done for Ruined, mm -hmm. what was the thing that, even though you may have heard about the conflict on the news, what was the thing that really stood out to you? Um, well, one of the things was actually having the Ugandans come over in December and getting to meet these two people, and one of them who was a client of Karen's, who had gotten these um, small loans and has, is now actually running for office in her local village. It's like, like a city councilor? Yeah, or something city like council. Mm -hmm. And actually, just yesterday, um, in an effort to kind of make this um, uh, material personal, we actually Skyped in five women from that small community in Uganda mm -hmm. with all of the actors in the room, and the actors got to ask them personally their questions and get answers directly from these women who had gone through similar experiences. So that was kind of amazing. Was there anything else in your research about um, finding an inroad for the characters that stuck out to you as a big surprise? Um, actually, the central character's name is Mama Nadi, mm -hmm. and she runs a small um, sort of bar slash brothel in the middle of the jungle. And as I was going through my, um, the internet, basically, I came across an article from the New York Times where they profiled a woman named Mama Dudu. And she was also an entrepreneur. She's also working right by the mines where all this gold and mm -hmm. coltan is coming out. And she's profiteering and making tons of money off of it. And this article was from 2001. So I shared that with the actress. And we both kind of thought maybe the playwright had seen that article and sparked the idea for the play. I, I can't prove that. but Because this is a contemporary playwright, you have the ability, uh, one would think, to reach out to the playwright and do some of your research that way. Is that something that you were able to do with Ruined? Um, I haven't done it yet. But actually, our director is really good friends with Lynn Nottage. Um, and so I think if, that, if it comes to that, we could absolutely do that. So since the director already has that connection, you weren't required to do that for this piece. Is that something that you often do with a living playwright? Um, definitely. Um, certainly if it's a world premiere play, then the playwrights are actually... Like the catch, Map like, of Heaven. Yeah. Um, then the playwrights are actually here working in the rehearsal room with you. So that's very easy. Um, if, if it's another uh, new play that has... Um, maybe been out for a year or something, you can, you can actually absolutely try to contact the playwright. So what's your favorite thing about being a dramaturg at the Denver Center Theater Company? I think it's just getting to dive into all these different plays. Each play is a different animal, and I get to research all these different areas, different cultures, different times in history, different playwrights. Um, so it's always something new, and that's what I like. Uh, all the new plays that we work on, they're brand new, they're fresh, they're unlike any other play that's ever been. Is it harder to do a play that's, uh, that has a history, or is it harder to do one that's brand new? Um, I think it could be hard on either side. I think, actually, you're right. Plays that have a history, uh, it's maybe easier to get your hands on that information because other people have gone down those roads before. If it's a new play, um, it might be more contemporary, and that means there are more sources that you can sort of research. Um, and you're sort of doing it for the first time. You're trailblazing with it. So it might be a little more um, hunting around to find what you're looking for. And you get to do that a lot here. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the most difficult thing about being a dramaturg at the Denver Center Theater Company? Um, I think the hardest thing is having to say no to so many playwrights. We probably get oh. 300 scripts you know, sent to us by agents. So these are reputable playwrights and reputable plays. But, you know, we, we only do 11 plays in a season, and out of them, maybe three or four will be new plays. So out of 300, we get to say yes to four in a season. Mm. Um, so that's, that's, that, I, that, that, I think, is the hard part. If it's challenging to say no to a playwright whose work you might mm -hmm. really love, yeah. what is it like when you get to say yes? Oh, that's the best thing in the world. Um, but actually, Kent Thompson... Uh, is the one who gets to say yes to the, the playwrights directly. 
He um, gets to say it directly, but you're sort of in on it. You know right. that the yes is coming. That's right. Um, it's, it's, it's a great thing because this is a, uh, a theater that has a great reputation in the country. All the playwrights that come in say, you know, we really treat them well, and there are a lot of resources here. And so they, when they get a call from us, they know that this is going to be a major production of their play. It's very exciting. And I, I, I can't let you go without seeing if when we come to the theater and we see these new plays, there are those documents that are out available for us yeah. in the lobby. Right. Is that part of what you're doing? That does fall under what I do. I actually am a sort and of... And they're the called... What, 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 it's in, inside, inside Out. out. Inside mm -hmm. Out. It's, we call them the study guides. Um, and I have two writers that write those, but I do the editing on them. So, yeah, that's something that we put out for the public to, um, again, dip into some of this research, get into some of that background. Well, I, I know that the, the cast and the, the creative people at the Denver Center Theater Company appreciate the work you do. And I know that the audience does, too, because I've seen people reading that material. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you for sort of sneaking away while you're just beginning rehearsal for Ruined to talk to me today. Thanks Great. so much. Great. My, pro my pleasure. Thank you. Now I meet with scenic designer Michael Gagno to find out how they created the world of Ruined. Michael, thank you for sneaking into this rehearsal room with your model of the set of Ruin for me. I, I have to say I'm already enthralled with the color and the levels and the texture. Tell me about where you began this process. Uh, well, first, we're lucky as, as theater artists because our, we get inspired by the script. Mm. Okay, so we read that. And then we ha typically have a conversation directly with the, the director who will bring to every script their own personal inspirations. And in this script, it takes place in sort of a roadhouse, is that correct? Yeah, you could call it a roadhouse or a, a ro yeah, yes. I'm not sure what the Congolese word would be for this, but like if we were from the South, we might call it a juke joint. joint. Mm -hmm. Or we might, it's, it's kind of a combination juke joint, uh, bordello. And we see that um, some of it is very rough-hewn looking in this model. Is that what we're going to expect because of the context of the play? Yes. Hopefully what you will experience is this, these, these opposites, the rough-hewn next to the completely modern, brightly colored, probably made in China, plastic water basin mm -hmm. or water jug or the plastic bowl that the peanuts are in. All those things are so ubiquitous. They are, and they're all over the globe now, and it's always a shock to go someplace that you think is way off the beaten track and find somebody listening to a CD of Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd say that's our world now. I also noticed that the colors seem to be very important in this set, both in the furniture and dressings, but even on maybe the back wall, I guess you'd call it. Tell me about that. Yeah, I, w <laughs> I, I chatted with the, the um, design assistants, Caitlin and Ruben, who actually fabricated this finished display model. The colors on it are a little more vivid than I think the audience will actually see in the finished set. Mm -hmm. However, the colors of the surrounding jungle will oh. be as vivid as you see them here in this model. And um, this space at the Ricketson Theater, I've seen the staff here, the creative team here, turn it into so many things. Um, and I see a little, little peak of a little space back there. Can you tell me about that? Yes. It, it is, um, this was kind of inspired by um, our experience, Sarette Scott's the director, and my experience walking in this theater when it was empty. And there is a large, uh, loading door on the back wall that's about four and a half feet above the ground and it's very unique to the Ricketson Theater. I mm -hmm. mean you don't find that. Anyway, we had been talking about the play and there's a moment at the end of Act One when I, without going into the story, um, somebody arrives and, and refuses to leave, mm. refuses to leave for three days and s stands in a way spiritual sentinel outside, refuses to enter. And we saw this space and we thought, maybe this is a great location for that character to, to stand, to wait. 
uh, because it's, it's slightly raised. It's behind and it's above this tiny little hole in the wall, hole in the middle of the jungle. And we then spun on that poetically to place him in front of a moon. Mm. Um, so that's what you see, the circular shape. And you, uh, you consistently have to use every single inch available to you at the Ricketson because it's not that it's a, deep. Yeah, it's a very small space. And, you know, you look for, you, you look for making your weaknesses your strengths. Mm. So in this case, one of the things uh, we tried to do was to capitalize on the cramped environment that this, this little spot would have been like. Another, and what, uh, in other words, not look for great vast room between tables or mm -hmm. between the pool, but to really say, no, th this is a small claustrophobic space. And that's important to the text as well. I think it's important to creating the tension in the, thea in the theater between actors that in this story, you're right, in the text, there are moments of very high tension. And if the room is big and roomy, then we can stand 20 feet apart from each other. There's no but danger. But there's no danger. Exactly. Exactly. And a small room fills up really quickly with fewer people than a big room. And so when you look at actually the, the, the technical business of producing a play, here we can make this space feel very crowded with uh, a reasonable number of actors. It's interesting also to see ahead of time the, the amount of work and detail that your team has gone into creating this or model of the stage. What happens to them after you've produced the real thing? Well, typically, this is a large theater company here in Denver, and I'm really lucky to be working here because it's like this is, this is the major leagues. The, I agree with you, by the they, way. They I think this is the major leagues. I, I think it is. I know it is. They have a large design studio downstairs to support work that I and other guest artists and other resident artists do. Mm -hmm. um, they will save all of their finished display models. They're on display downstairs that the public can see when they come through on tours offered by the theater company. Oh. This model is not a creation of ego, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's a working tool that typically is in the rehearsal hall. In the rehearsal hall, they're rehearsing on a flat floor with oh. everything taped with masking tape on the floor. So any, any, any level change, any step is indicated only with a tape mark on the floor. They do not rehearse on the set. So having a maquette or a model of the real thing, they can constantly look at and refer to and say, no, 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 you'll be higher than she is because you're standing there on that step looking down at her. So it's critical that this is done so early because it informs the work that the actors are doing in rehearsal. It, 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 is, it is critical, or you could say, uh, it is now, an, it is a necessity based on the way we work mm. professionally. Well, I really appreciate you s sort of stealing a little bit of time from that t compressed time schedule to come and explain not just the work on this particular piece, but your work here at the Denver Center Theater Company. Thank you so much. It Michael. has been my pleasure. Thank you. And finally, Jana Mitchell gives us a guided tour through the scene shop at the Denver Center Theater Company as they prepare for Ruined. My, well, the, the quickest explanation that I give people is that we are like a giant color Xerox machine. Um, a lot of people confuse our job with the designer, uh, and the designer is the one that with the director decides what something's going to look like. And then we are the one that blow it up and make it a reality. They take a picture and it's all good and, you know, they can sit at their table and do this. And the reality is I ha we have to do the textures and the paint and make the real thing function within the play as well as look like what their vision is. Um, we are currently working on the platforming for Rund and we used recycled wood that we've used in other shows so we have a variety of different woods and this one there's a lot of feeling we have to put into this and what this wood has been through um, so this is in the middle of a jungle in Africa and this wood has traveled a long way to get here and it's just salvaged pieces and so we have to make this wood look what we think 
it would look like after it's been through the jungle and been out exposed to the weather for years and years and years and stuff. And that's one of the things we do a lot of, is distressing, making new things look old. And even though you have to make it look real, often it gets so far from being real. What are some of the most interesting techniques or challenges you've been faced with for Ruined? For Ruined? Um, this is this is a this comes up occasionally uh, over the years is wants to look all rough and worn uh, war torn and so it's all this rough wood but there's barefoot actors we always have to consider the actors and you don't want to get splinters in their feet and you know things like that so a lot of the challenges we have are function not necessarily the look of how the actors uh, need to interact with it or the audience for that matter sometimes it's like okay the audience is too close to that so it can't be this or it can't be that you know it needs to look real this close the Denver Center Theatre Company's production of Ruin runs from March 18th through April 30th visit denvercenter.org for ticket information that's all for this edition. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. With all that Colorado has to offer, we're here to help you keep it in focus. Thanks for watching. Good night. Go bug.